You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, I guess about a month ago, or maybe not that long, I don't really remember to tell you the truth, I began a broadcast well after the halfway mark of the broadcast had gone by on the Rose Cross. And the meaning of the Rose upon the Cross and the Rose Cross order and, of course, I didn't get very far before the broadcast was over. So I'm going to start all over again tonight. And uh, we're going we're gonna to do that now. I suggest you get pen and paper because this is one of those broadcasts that you're going to want to take notes and you're going to want to remember. And if you can't take notes, you can't remember, or the static or the propagation is bad, then you can always order the tape. For non-members, they're $10. For members, they're $8. If you don't know whether you're a member or not, then you're not. It's as simple as that. So you don't even need to call and ask. And uh, make check or money order payable to Harvest, H-A-R-V-E-S-T, and send them to Harvest, P.O. Box 1970, Eager, spelled E-A-G-A-R, Arizona, 85925. <laughs> the ancient order of the Rosti Cruci, all stem from the same origin. The name of the organization itself is an apt illustration 
of the uncanny ability to interpret all things and make them fit. It happens that in the 13th century, a man named Christian Rosenkreutz, or so they say, began to bring out into the open teachings which hitherto had been promulgated only in secret. Christian Rosenkreutz, what a name to conjure with. Did he really exist? From the depths of all of the research that we have done here, I can tell you that it is extremely doubtful if any such man ever lived, but was more possibly a creation of the secret order, of the mystery religion, stemming from ancient Babylon in order to create a reawakening in the minds of the curious men and women emerging from what had been called throughout history the Dark Ages. He supposedly founded the mysterious order of Rosicrucians, or Rosi Cruci, with the object of throwing occult light upon the misunderstood Christian religion. Now, don't you think it's a little bit too coincidental that here is this man coming up with an ancient Christian religion, or the religion of the Christos, the perfection of the soul through the adversities of the crucifixion of life's trials, and his name is Christian Rosenkreutz. Supposedly, his religion is to explain the mystery of life and being from the scientific standpoint in harmony with religion. And this has always been one of the goals of the mysteries is to make some kind of a reconciliation between science and religion or in language that you might more readily understand between Lucifer and God. All of which it will be seen might have been written by Theosophical Rogers or Sinet, all except for the symbolical name Christian Rosenkreutz. The Rosicrucians have taken the offense out of the cross and they call that esoteric Christianity. The cross should not be interpreted as an emblem of suffering and shame, so reads the amazing account of this mystic Christianity, but rather it is the means of the perfection of the soul, the apotheosis of man, if you will. What then did and does it stand for? Well, you could ask Plato, who was an initiate and wrote the world soul is crucified. With these words, we are informed the Greek philosopher gave out occult truth, or so they say. And what is that truth? That the cross is symbolical of the life currents vitalizing the bodies of plants, animal, and man. In other words, through the living of life, through the learning of lessons, through the facing and overcoming of adversity, comes the perfection of the soul, the intellect, the man. It is symbolical of man's past evolution, present constitution, and future development. And they call this the Christian religion? Well, in fact, it is not, ladies and gentlemen. This religion, in fact, existed long before the man that you know as Jesus ever was born or walked upon this earth. It is what we now look back and call the Gnostic or Nazarene. The mineral kingdom, these people say, ensouls all chemical substance of whatever kind so that the cross of whatever material it is made is first symbol of that kingdom. The upright lower limb of the cross is a symbol of the plant kingdom because the currents of the group of spirits which give life to the plants 
come from the center of the earth, or Gia, the mother, where these group spirits are located and reach out toward the periphery of our planet. Planet, and then into space. Of course, you have to have a tremendous stretch of your imagination to believe any of this. None of it can be proven. It is like all religions, ladies and gentlemen. It is accepted as a matter of faith. The upper limb of the cross is the symbol of man, they say, because the life currents of the human kingdom pass downward from the sun, spelled S-U-N, the manifestation of God's power to this earth, through the vertical spine. Thus man is the inverted plant. For as the plant takes its food through the root, passing it upward, so does the man take his nourishment by way of the head, passing it downward. I saw a commercial on television this evening that manifests this very story. It showed the brilliant sun and the moon and then it showed the product being sold with the reflection in its perfectly polished hood and roof of the inverted tree roots stretched up to heaven for nourishment. The leaves and branches pointed down toward the earth. You are being bombarded with the symbology of this ancient, mystery, esoteric, hidden religion every day, and you don't even know it. I challenge you, watch for that commercial and many, many others. Remember, the sun is the manifestation of the generative force, the phallus, the penis. Without the sun or the generative force, no life could exist upon this planet. The moon, well, let me go back to the sun for a second. The manifestation of this generative force in symbology on the earth is the obelisk of the Washington Monument, if you will. The moon is the reflective, our receptive of the two. The sun being the male, the moon being the female, reflecting the pure light of her master onto the earth. The moon, in symbology, is represented by the reflecting pool. In Washington, D.C., you'll see the obelisk, the Washington Monument, and then the reflecting pool, long and narrow, the Washington Monument being the phallus or the penis, the reflecting pool being the feminine or the vagina, and they point directly toward the Oval Office in the White House, which is the egg from which are hatched the full body of adepts, are Horus, the child, who will bring into being the new order, the golden dawn. <laughs> have I, have I shaken your tree? I certainly hope so. The sun or the obelisk or the phallus is the doctrine. The moon or the reflecting pool or the vagina is the church. And Horus, the child, represents the full body of the priesthood, the adepts, who will bring about the realization and the teaching of the doctrine of the church, of the hidden mystery religion, of the worship. of the sun. Now that's for the masses, ladies and gentlemen. For these adepts, these priests do not believe that the sun is indeed God, but the manifestation of God's power, of the light. But they also believe that the God of the Bible is a corrupt, degenerate, cruel, and inhuman God. And that that God is evil. Their God is the manifestation of light. Lucifer, cast out of heaven for challenging the authority of God who became the ruler of the material world. And that is what they worship, the material world. Happiness, 
wealth, money, perversion, temptations. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. The plant is chaste, pure, and passionless, and stretches its creative organ, the flower, chastely and unshamed toward the sun, a thing of beauty and delight. Man turns his passion, filled generative organ, toward the earth. Man inhales the life-giving oxygen and exhales the poisonous carbon dioxide. The plant takes the poison exhaled by man, building its body therefrom, and returning to us the elixir of life, the cleansed oxygen. Now you can see how they can turn a phrase, a word, how they can make right wrong and wrong right, very simply, ladies and gentlemen, because they make man seem as if he is poisoning something. But you see, oxygen is poisonous to the plant. What man is doing, the plant is doing, and that makes a balance in nature. If man did not exhale carbon dioxide, which their religion labels poison, which the wonderful, beautiful green plants inhale and purify and exhale oxygen, <laughs> then the earth would be, of course, destroyed. What they don't tell you is if the opposite happened, if there were no men, if there were no animals, if the plants inhaled the carbon dioxide and exhaled oxygen, you would soon reach a point where the earth would be in danger of consuming itself by fire. And all living things would perish in the flame. You see, because oxygen is a poison to the plant. This deception and this kind of gobbledygook of backwards looking in the mirror type reasoning exists today in the Green Party, in the Sierra Club, in the environmental wacko crowd. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing, nothing at all bad about wanting to preserve the environment or take care of our natural resources, but not to the point of lies and deceptions and just out and out idiocy. It is the hallmark of these people. That they can look each other in the face, lie to each other, know that they are lying to each other, and accept it and like each other and go about their business. I could never do that in a million years. I don't know about you. They say that between the plant and the human kingdom stands the animal with the horizontal spine, and in the horizontal spine the life currents of the animal group spirit play as they circle around the globe. Therefore, the horizontal limb of the cross is the symbol of the animal kingdom. The animal, which is symbolized by the horizontal limb of the cross, is between plant and man. Its spine is in horizontal position, and through it play the currents of animal group spirit, which encircle the earth. Were you aware that this group spirit of all the animals is playing up and down your spine? <laughs> to keep him steadfast and true through adversity, the cross or the rose cross, holds aloft as an inspiration the glorious consummation in store for him that overcometh. Remember what I told you? And points to Christ as the star of hope. And Christ, in their language, ladies and gentlemen, has nothing to do with the Christ of your language. See, they call Christ the star of hope, the first fruits, who wrought that choicest of all gems, the Philosopher's Stone, while inhabiting, inhabiting the body of Jesus. You see, to them, Jesus was not the Son of God manifest in the flesh, living and walking upon this earth. Nope. To them, Christ is an office that can be held by anyone or everyone. And in the new age, the goal is to become Christed, to perfect your soul, to discover the philosopher's stone, to become the Christ. Or, 
as some would believe, to be such a good person and have such a good, clean body as a temple that the Christ would choose to walk into your body and thus perform his office amongst us here on earth. This then interprets the Rosicrucian emblem, the cross as well as the star against which it stands, while the garland of roses around the center of the cross points to yet another symbolism. In the form, where it is represented with a single rose in the center, it symbolizes the spirit radiating from itself the four vehicles, the dense, vital, and desire bodies plus the mind, where the spirit has drawn into its instruments and become the indwelling human spirit. But there was a time when that condition did not obtain, these people believe, a time when the threefold, threefold spirit hovered above its vehicles and was unable to enter. Man did not have a soul, and they believe that man today does not have a soul, but through the perfection of good works, man realizes or discovers his soul, the soul enters the body, and through the perfection of the soul, through facing the adversities of life and overcoming and conquering and taking full advantage of the material world, they become God. It's the same doctrine that is taught in the Mormon Church, in Freemasonry, and I could go on and on. So many. The worldwide Church of God, as you heard on the tape, they believe exactly the same thing. Then the cross stood alone without the rose, symbolizing the condition which prevailed in the early third of Atlantis. This is another legend that they believe in. There was even a time when the upper limb of the cross was lacking and man's constitution was represented by the Tau. That was in the Lemurian epoch. They also believe in that legend. And they believe that in the Lemurian epoch, man only had the dense, vital, and desire body, but lacked the mind. Then the animal nature was paramount. Man followed desire without reserve. At a still earlier time, in the Hyperborean epoch, he was also minus the desire body and possessed only the dense and vital bodies. Then man, in the making, was like the plants, chaste and devoid of desire. At that time, his constitution could not have been represented by a cross. It was symbolized by a straight shaft, a pillar. This is where all of the theory of evolution comes from, ladies and gentlemen, right out of the mysteries. It is as ancient as man himself. It was not discovered by Charles Darwin. <laughs> it has been believed and promulgated and passed down from father to son and mother to daughter through these secret fraternal orders and mystery religions since the very beginning. Thought and voice, we are told further, are both creative. But the selfish, dominating, creative faculty symbolized by the larynx at the crossing of head and body must give way to a less selfish creative force. It is here that the roses enter. For the rose, like any other flower, is the generative organ of the plant. Its green stem carries the colorless, passionless plant blood. The blood-red rose shows the passion-filled blood of the human race. But in the rose, the vital fluid is not sensuous. It is chaste and pure. Thus, it is an excellent symbol, ladies and gentlemen, of the generative organ in the pure and holy state to which man will attain when he has cleansed and purified his blood of desire, when he has become chaste, pure, and Christ-like, or Christed, or to go even one further, when he becomes as God. Remember the promise of Lucifer in the Garden of Eden? If you don't, go back to your Bible and read it, for that's what this is all about. 
Thus we get the cross, the long limb representing the body, the two horizontals, the two arms, and the short upper limb, the head, with the circle of roses around the center instead of the larynx. Therefore, the Rosai Cruci looks ardently forward to the day when the roses shall bloom upon the cross of humanity. Therefore, the elder brothers greet the aspiring soul with the words of the Rosicrucian greeting, and I quote, May the roses bloom upon your cross, end quote. And therefore the greeting is given in the meetings of the fellowship, centers by the leader to the assembled students, probationers, and disciples who respond to the greeting by saying, quote, and on yours also, end quote. The rose is the international symbol of socialism. One red rose was handed to everyone who attended the memorial service of the victims of the bombing of the Mira Federal Building in Oklahoma City. All of the government officials who took part had a ceremony after the end of the rescue and cleanup and the raising and destruction of the building, and they all placed one red rose upon a makeshift altar. Bill Clinton was photographed holding one red rosebud to his nose, and in his speech he made the incredible statement, those who have sacrificed, and I would remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that a sacrifice is an intentional act for the appeasement of the gods to ensure the success of your endeavor. When he made that statement, he was spilling the beans, but only for those who understand the symbology, the esoteric language of the ancient brotherhood. It is all very profound for those who understand it. Quite esoteric, which means hidden, and eminently fitting the name of Christian Rosencruz of the 13th century. Perhaps, though the name was not quite as accidental as an outsider might surmise, we are told that this Mr. Rosencruz, or rather the ego dwelling in him, the Christ within, was already then a high spiritual teacher. His birth as Christian Rosencruz merely marks the beginning of a new epoch in spiritual life in the Western world, and he has since that day taken a new body when his successive vehicles have outlived their usefulness or circumstances, rendered it expedient that he changed the scene of his activities. He inspired Bacon's works, although through an intermediary, they believe, and he enlightened the mystic Jacob Bohm. He is also embodied today an initiate of high degree, an active and potent factor in all affairs of the West. But they say he is unknown to the world. Of course, because if you try to point him out, everyone would quickly discover that this whole concept is one of the biggest frauds ever foisted upon mankind.
Ladies and gentlemen, there are people asking why, and the people that are asking the most pointed, the most important questions why are those that belong to the intelligence service of the Second Continental Army of the Republic Militia. We have not only asked why, we have found the answer to those questions. We have documented those answers in interviews, on tape, in videos, in actual United States government documents, in statements, press releases, Freudian slips by the liars and deceivers who would manipulate us into their totalitarian socialist world order. And we have exposed them to the bare bones. In a book entitled Oklahoma City, Day One, by Michelle Marie Moore, Major Intelligence Service, commanding the station chief of four states, including the state of Oklahoma, for the Second Continental Army of the Republic. If you would like to have a copy, send $30. $30, ladies and gentlemen. Make your money order payable to Harvest, H-A-R-V-E-S-T, and send it to Harvest, Post Office Box 1970, Eager, spelled E-A-G-A-R, Arizona, 85925. Do it now. There are only going to be a certain number of books printed so you'd better get your order in now. It depends upon how fast these initial printed first edition books go and what the demand is for more, whether any more will ever be printed. So you'd better create that demand, ladies and gentlemen. This book will... That was a false statement. This book already has made history. No one can stop its publication. No one can stop its publication. By any means whatsoever. If you'd like an autographed copy, send $35 postpaid. Make your money order payable to Harvest. Send to Harvest, P.O. Box 1970, Eager, spelled E-A-G-A-R, Arizona, 85925, and join those dedicated men and women who have pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to protect and defend the freedoms of all of us, regardless of race, religion, creed, or source of ancestral origin. Stand up. Be a real American. There's no reason for you to lose your mind Cause I've seen something that's gonna change our time If I Thank you. 
With all this symbolism, ladies and gentlemen, Christian emblems of long standing are made to fit in. This is also what they say. But if you really study the Christian religion, you'll find that many of these symbols existed long before Christ was even born and actually do not belong to the Christian religion at all, but were melded with the teachings and the followers of Christ when Constantine made Christianity the official religion of Rome in order to preserve the Roman Empire, which then became the Vatican. He melded the Roman pantheon of saints with the Christian religion. The celebration of the sacrifice upon the altar, the rites, the rites, ladies and gentlemen, of Ishtar in spring, and the celebration of the winter solstice, which became Christian Christmas. And all of these things extended the rule of the Roman Empire for another 1,200 years as the emperor became the pope and the empire became the Catholic Church. In Esso terrorism, the cross was never looked upon as an instrument of torture, and it was not until the 6th century that the crucified Christ was shown in pictures. This is fact. Previous to that time, the symbol of the Christ was a cross and a lamb resting on its foot, to convey the idea that at the time when Christ was born, the sun at the vernal equinox crossed the equator in the sign of Aries, the lamb. Some claimed that the vernal equinox at his birth was really in the sight of the sign of Pisces, the fishes, and that the symbol of our Savior should have been a fish. It is in memory of that dispute that the bishop's mitre still takes the form of the head of a fish. St. John evidently lacked this occult information and in his ignorance interpreted the lamb in Old Testament style as a sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. And the early Christians who for fear of being betrayed to the enemy drew a fish in the sand to see if there were an understanding response. Interpreted the symbol of the fish like this, ladies and gentlemen. Ichthus. I-C-H-T-H-U-S, the Greek for fish. 
I -E -S -O -S. I -E -S -O -U -S. C H Ristos. Are you following me? If you take I C H T H U S, the Greek word for fish, and break it down into these parts, I and add E S O U S or Iusus, take C H and add Ristos for Christos, then the T H and add E O U, Theo. U I O S S at O T R. In effect, what you have when you pronounce the Greek word for fish or draw the fish in the sand is Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. The explanation of the cross, however, contains sufficient hints that other Rosicrucian or Rostai Crucai doctrines to launch us upon a more complete, though ever so brief, exposition of this complicated system of thought. For we have heard of the various bodies of man, of many spirits, of evolution through reincarnation, and of many races, all believed in by these people. And I have exposed all of these beliefs right down to the very basis foundation of these doctrines over many, many hours of broadcasts of the hour of the time. They believe there are seven worlds which together form the universe. Each one is amenable to laws which are practically inoperative in the other. Exactly the architecture of the myth of Atlantis. And it comes right out of the, not the Middle Eastern, but the ancient Eastern religions, specifically Hindu. For instance, the laws of gravitation and of contraction and expansion to which matter is subject in the physical, or what they call the lowest world, do not exist in the next higher, or what is known as the desire world. Neither is there heat or cold there. Each world is subdivided into seven regions, or subdivisions of matter. In the physical world, we have denser forms, namely solids, liquids, and gases, and also four ethers of varying densities. And it is this that Plato was exposing in his discussion and his elaboration upon the so-called ancient city of Atlantis, which never, ladies and gentlemen, really existed. But ether still remains a physical matter. The four etherics together form the etheric region. Above all this is the universal spirit expressing itself in the visible world as four great streams of life. Remember the four rivers at varying stages of development. This fourfold spiritual impulse molds the chemical matter of the earth into variegated forms of the four kingdoms, mineral, plant, animal, and man. The etheric region of the physical world, according to these people, is as tangible to the clairvoyant as are the solids, liquids, and gases of the chemical region to ordinary people. The clairvoyant, they say, sees four ethers, chemical ether, life ether, light ether, reflecting ether, all of which science has proven, without any doubt, do not exist. Rather than invent instruments to learn the secrets of nature, as does the scientist, the occultist would develop the investigator himself. And since the occultist is the only one who ever sees these things, any challenge becomes in their eyes a revelation of your status on a lower rung. So they've got all the bases covered. Thus, they find that their senses or faculties may become the open sesame in searching for truth. This is why they are so wedded to the material world. Even in their search for spirituality, it is only done through the material world, through the desire body, through the five senses. 
They say that the trained senses of the clairvoyant see clearly the interaction between the physical and the etheric body of man. For instance, the chemical ether expels from the physical body of man the materials in food which are unfit for use negative pole, and also assimilates that which can be incorporated into the body, positive pole. They forget to tell you the same thing happens with plants, <laughs> and microbes, and birds. The life ether, also working through a positive and a negative pole, takes care of the forces of propagation. The positive working in the female during the period of gestation, and the negative pole of life enabling the male to produce semen. What absolute gobbledygook. But they thrive on this. They believe that light ether negatively operates through the senses, manifesting the passive functions of sight, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling. And it also builds and nourishes the eye. Positively, it is the avenue of the forces that circulate the blood. In plants and animals, light ether is responsible for color. And then there is the reflecting ether. It has in it the reflections of the memory of nature, as the giant ferns of the childhood of the earth have left their pictures in the coal beds. I'm sure those giant ferns, you know, <laughs> uh, were acting as film, or was acting as the camera and the light when they lay down upon the film of some ancient mud river hoping to leave their picture for those of us in the future. More absolute ridiculosity. <laughs> if there is such a word, probably not. But my word ridiculosity is just as good as their no such nonsense. They say that no clairvoyant likes to read in this book of memory as the pictures are blurred. I bet they are. Spiritist mediums and psychometers may be forced to do that sort of thing. The Rosicrucian clairvoyant rises to greater heights, knowing that in higher worlds, nature has better memories. And all this is to cover the fact that if you ask them what the memory tells them, this is their way out. The desire world, like the physical world, and like every other realm of nature, according to these people, has the seven subdivisions, called regions, just like the city of Atlantis. But it does not have the four great divisions of chemical, etc., desire stuff, and the desire world, persisting through its seven subdivisions or regions as material for the embodiment of desire. The desires... Wishes, passions, and feelings of man express themselves through these seven regions of desire matter, which is only one degree less dense than the matter of the physical world. It is not a finer physical matter, according to them. Rather, it is an unceasing motion, a vibration, so to speak, whereas the matter of the physical world is inert or harmless, does not act in concert with anything else, to either create or destroy. The desire world is ever-changing light and color in which forces of animal and man intermingle with the forces of innumerable hierarchies of spiritual beings which mold, they say, our desires. And they reflect their own philosophy, their own belief in these hierarchies in their creation of these fraternal orders with their hierarchies of degrees where they are profane, initiates, blue lodges, and of course the elect or the elite who reach the highest levels, all looking for that magical secret, which when discovered reveals only the means of controlling many others through that promise of that magical secret, which has never, does not now, 
and most likely will never exist. Their desires in turn create interest. Interest, once it is thoroughly aroused, starts the forces of attraction and repulsion, and uh, then uh, things begin to happen. It is the meaning of the pyramid, uh, or I should say, the triangle. The triangle is made up of, actually the pyramid is made up of four triangles, ladies and gentlemen. But the triangle represents thought, desire, and action. Observe this verbatim quote, if you will, which they say points out the close resemblance of the Western occultism to the Oriental esoteric Remember, esoteric means hidden Christianity. Not the Christianity that you know, or that you practice in your church, or that you read from your Bible, or that you observe in your home. But the hidden Christianity that existed before the birth of Christ and the worship of the perfection of the soul, the Luciferian religion that man himself will become God. I quote, The physical and the desire worlds are not separated from each other by space. They are closer than hands and feet. It is not necessary to move to get from one to the other, nor from one region to the next. Just as solids, liquids, and gases are all together in our bodies, interpenetrating one another, so are the different regions of the desire world within us also. End quote. The world of thought, they believe, consists of seven regions of varying qualities and densities, and like the physical world, the world of thought is divided into two main divisions, the region of concrete thought composing the four densest regions and the region of abstract thought comprising the three regions of finest substance. All of this is thought of as consisting, if not of material, at least of, quote, mind stuff, end quote. The thought forms are acting as regulators and balance wheels upon the impulses engendered in the desire world by impacts from the phenomenal world. And on Monday night, ladies and gentlemen, we will go into their beliefs regarding the evolution of man, the separation of mankind into different races, the races that have existed, and the races that they believe are coming. Good night. And God bless each and every single one of you.
Touch me.